10th chapter, Mark chapter 10, and we'll be there in just a moment. It's been pointed out several times that we have those who are visiting among us, and we're very thankful for your presence. Hope that you can be back and be with us any time that you might have the opportunity to do so, any time that you might be in this area. You know, one of the things that you think about when you're going to be participating in the public worship or leading minds in worship is that you not be a hindrance to anyone, that it be something that would help in our attempt to lift up praise before God, to adore Him. Truly in worship, we're not the audience. God is the audience. We're the ones who participate in bringing that worship to Him as the object that is worthy of worship, the only one worthy of worship. And I appreciate so much what we've had this morning, the lesson from JP, uh, the lessons that we've had in the classes, uh, Kurt here in uh, this particular auditorium, and the leading of the singing by those who have done so. It's always a pleasure to see Aaron lead singing because it gets you into it. I grew up around R.J. Stevens leading singing, and he always would point out to us, we don't lead the song, we lead the meaning. And uh, that point of trying to get out of a song, what it is that God wants us to see and to praise and to magnify his name truly is what ought to be. And as it's been said to others, I think, Randy, you don't ever have to apologize about the emotion when we read the story of the crucifixion of Jesus. Any of us who can do that and go through it without a tear in our eye needs to examine the heart. The recognition of what all Jesus has done for us, the recognition of who he is and what he means to us is something that ought to move us each day of our life. And if we get too old and cynical to have that, then we need to go back and get a dose of the cross all over again and to notice all that he does indeed, all that he is and all that he ought to be to us. In Mark chapter 10, there is an account of one who comes to Jesus, asks him a question, and Jesus speaks to him. In Mark 10, verse 17, start with me. Now, as he was going out on the road, One came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack. Go your way, sell what you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word. And went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Here Jesus pointed out to him that he was one who needed to do something. And what we need to do is look at this account and notice several things about it. First off, I want us to notice who this man was. He was not just your average Joe out there. He was an affluent man. He was a leader among his people. The point is made. In Luke chapter 18, in a parallel account of this, Luke 18 in verse 18 points out that he was a ruler. And in verse 24 of that same account, it points out that he was one that was rich. And the same thing is pointed out here as well. That he was a rich man. That he had great possessions. But this man was not just interested in his wealth. The question that is preeminent on his mind which he speaks to Jesus is, what do I need to do that I may inherit eternal life? That's the thing that he's asking about. He had some concern about this. 
It wasn't just that he had material concerns and nothing else, no spiritual ones. He wants to know what it is that I need to do to inherit eternal life. I don't want to miss that. There's another thing about that, and that is when he was asked by Jesus, what may I do, what did Jesus answer him? He didn't answer to him, well, I think it's this way. Or you seem to me to be a good guy. Jesus said, you know the commandments. This is what they say. He referred him to that which was the word of Almighty God. When that was done, he referred him to that because he loved him. The statement is that Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And when he did that, he said to him something out of that love that came from his heart toward this man. And that was that he spoke to him saying, one thing you lack. Just one thing. There's one thing that you need to do if you really want eternal life, that you may have that eternal life. He says, you go sell what you have, you give to the poor, you come follow me. That's the thing you need to do. Now, a lot of people will point out, no, 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 that's not something that's necessary. Yes, it was. Jesus said you need to do this to inherit eternal life. He knew something about this man. It's not necessary for everyone to sell what they have, give to the poor, and come follow Jesus. But Jesus recognized this man's riches were separating him from what he needed to do, to have a spiritual mindset that stayed there, not just at this moment when he was asking, what do I need to do, but at every moment as well. And what he needed to do was come follow Jesus and learn more about that, that he might truly follow Jesus. When we look at this, I think we learn something from seeing these things about what happened. When Jesus tells him, here's what it is, one thing you lack, this whole account gives us some very good lessons that we need to learn carefully in our life. The first lesson I would suggest to you is that we live in an age when this man would have been, in many cases, he would have been justified. They would have said, this guy is a great fellow. What's the problem with him? After all, he wanted something of eternal life. He gave some effort to go out and seek that from Jesus. It wasn't that he was just sitting around doing what he wanted to do and Jesus happened to walk by. He went out to seek him and to ask him this question. There's something else. This man shows by his very character and what he says, Jesus having no rebuttal to it whatsoever, that he was not only moral, but that he was honest. He took what Jesus said and reflected upon that honestly and he was respectful. He came to Jesus and recognized who he was. It's not like many of those who were leaders and affluent around Jesus during all of his lifetime that mocked him and did other things that were against him. This man had a respect and recognized that Jesus spoke correctly. He also was one who Jesus pointed out that without a change, you're not going to inherit eternal life. Now, with all of the good things about him, there was still a problem. And that problem was one that wasn't just his overall character was bad. His overall character was good. But Jesus recognized there's one thing that's keeping you from eternal life. And he wanted to talk to him about that. When you see that kind of person that's looked at, what would our world say about him? Uh, it's just one thing. What's the big deal? No problem with that. Overall, he seems to be a good fellow. He has a penitent kind of attitude. He seems to be respectful to Jesus. Look, this guy's just fine. That's the idea that's out there in many places. But the problem is, that isn't what Jesus said about him. You see, Jesus recognized something. And what he recognized, he brought this man to see, and we need to understand 
that one sin or one failure can keep us out of heaven. You know, we live in an age in which there are many who would tell us that it's a terrible thing if we talk to people and we get them to believe that just one sin is a problem. Just one sin could keep you from heaven. Well, let's look and see what the Bible says about it. Over in 1 John, in 1 John, and in the third chapter and in verse 4, let's see what the problem with sin is. It says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. There's a way in which that's put in the original language that's real simple. We get it in English as well. Whoever continues to commit sin, he says at first, what he's doing, he commits at that point lawlessness. In other words, each sin as it's being committed is a problem. Why? Because it's lawless. That when you look at each one of those points, they are not according to what the law of God says. And so John's point is, when we look at that and we see committing of sin, a life of that each time is that which is opposed to law. Now, what I know about that which is opposed to law? Well, let's go back to Matthew chapter 7. In the Sermon on the Mount, in verse 23, Jesus says, Then will I declare unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And we need to remind ourselves of who he's saying this to. Go back up to verse 21 and notice what he says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that, now gets this, he that does the will of my Father in heaven. That's a statement parallel to what we find back over there in 1 John chapter 3. Commit sin. He is doing that sin. He's continuing in that way. Well, what's this guy doing? He's doing that which is lawless. He said, the one who says to me, not everyone who says he, uh, that uh, Lord, Lord shall enter to heaven, but he that what? He that does the will of my Father in heaven. He's continuing to do the will of the Father. Now look at it in verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? In other words, through the time of their life, what had they been doing? They had been doing those things. They had been doing what was right, and what was good? They had called on him as Lord. They had been doing many things that were right. But what else had they done? Now, verse 23. The point is made, Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who what? Practice lawlessness. At this time, you're doing something that is not according to the law of God. There's a point that's being made here. I may do many things that are good and live in a way that has many right things before God. But what if I am doing something at this point which is not according to the will of God, for which there is no approval of divine authority? then what do I do? I never knew you. Not just I don't know you right now. That negates everything else. You're not with me at all at this point. Do you see the idea that's pointed out there? It's a scary notion to think at first, I may be doing a lot of things that are right, but if I'm not following the will of God all the way, there's a problem there. How about going a little further and noticing something? In Romans chapter 6 and in verse 23, the Apostle Paul says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Then they come along and say, well, now I want to have more confidence in my salvation than to just say, here I come along and I do one sin and I'm cast off for God forever, just like nothing else matters. Surely a loving God wouldn't do that. You know what I need to do? I need to get out of God's business and get in my business. What I can do is think about what's necessary for me to do, to do the will of God. And the wages of sin is what? Death. What sin has a wage of death? What sin doesn't have a wage of death? What sin's okay for you to commit? You won't die of it. All I know is the wages of sin, period, is death. Now, what does that tell me? I better leave it there with God. When I come along and start making a distinction, let me show you exactly where we have the problem that comes out there in the religious world. Someone says, no, no, murder, you can't do that and be all right. You can't be forgiven of that sin even as you're committing it. Well, how about that white lie that JP was talking about a little while this morning? Is that okay? I just told a white lie. Is that one a sin that will cause me to be dead? I lied. I told something that wasn't true. Now, what if in that lie I told something that wasn't true and it's caused somebody else to be murdered? Is that lie still okay? Well, now that lie looks a little blacker now, doesn't it? But maybe that lie helps somebody not to be found and killed. So that's a little whiter, isn't it? But if I did that and that one person wasn't found, but five others were that were murdered, now what does that lie look like? You see, the problem of that is when I'm defining the nature of sin, and what is a sin worthy of death and what isn't, I'm getting into an area that I don't belong in. That's God's prerogative, not mine. And let me suggest to you something. That's so in both ways. When someone comes along and says, well, now I can't be God, and so I can't judge about that. So far, I'm with you all the way. But let me tell you something of where you go too far. When I come along and give somebody the idea, you can commit this sin or that sin or some sin or whatever, and you can still be saved by God. Because I'm not the one to judge. God is. He's the one who knows. I've given a hope of something that I have no scripture behind at all. I know of no scripture that gives me hope in any sin. Now, is it true that there's one lawgiver and judge, as Paul pointed out? Absolutely. Who's that? That's Jesus. And how am I going to be judged? I'm going to be judged by his words. And what should I do? I should leave it there. I want to give nothing that would affirm anybody's right to commit a sin and yet be right with God. Nor do I want to affirm I'm going to take over God's place. What I do need to affirm very clearly is God meant what he said. and His word is clear. And I can say nothing to negate that or add to that. God's word has to be left right where it is. Now what did Jesus, both the lawgiver and the judge, say to this man? He said, there's one thing you lack. And I know that one thing that he lacked would keep him from heaven. Now, if I can look at that and say, that's what he said. That's what I have to say. Then that's what's important for us to look at. Not to get it one way or the other shaded after our own kind of a fashion, I need to be there where God is. When it becomes more important for me to say, oh, we have to give some assurance of our salvation, 
You know what I need to give more of and what I need to care more about is the truth of Almighty God. That God said it, and that's it. It's true at that point. It is true all the way from there on, and I need to affirm that. That brings us to the next thing about this that we need to look at, and that is that it's loving to show when someone is lacking and lost. What did it say? The account said Jesus looked at him and he loved him and he said one thing, you're welcome. When people say, well, somebody who says you're lost for what you're doing, they're unloving. They're not as they should be. They've just called Jesus unloving. They better talk to him about that. The point being made is it is right to notice when someone is doing that which brings death. The wages of sin is death. And Jesus noted that point with this man. I want you to notice back over in John 4 that very same thing. We're not going to read all the way through that. But you remember the story. Jesus comes to a well, and there's a Samaritan woman that meets him there. And she is one who's asking him some questions. Jesus, in the process of it, points out to her, you're living with a man that you're not married to. He's not your husband. You've had several others, but this guy isn't him. It also points out we're worshiping in Jerusalem because that's what the scriptures say. You're worshiping what you know not. Both of those were points of noting with this woman you're doing something that's wrong before God. But what do we know about this woman? He loved her. He's taking the concern to be with her and speak with her that even his disciples didn't understand. Why is he speaking to a woman and a Samaritan woman at that? They wouldn't have taken their time and all of that. Jesus loved her. And in loving her, he told her, you're in a relationship that's not right with God, and you've been worshiping in a way that's not right with God either. Now he holds out the truth and the hope that comes from that. But it's loving to point out the wrong that is there. So many times when people get the idea that it's unloving to say to someone what you're doing is wrong, they're thinking of feelings on this earth. You know what? If you tell me, here's what's necessary for you to go to heaven, I hope my attitude is I care about that a whole lot more than whether you happen to hurt my feelings on something personal. Because what's important is whether we go to heaven or not. And what was important with this woman was for Jesus to point out, you're doing that which is wrong, and you need to go back and look at the Scripture to do what's right. And that's exactly what his point is with regard to the rich young ruler as well. One thing you lack, and it was important for him to understand that one thing. I've heard many of my brethren in recent years talk about the idea we need to present the Word of God lovingly. And the idea that they bring up is based off of what's talked about in Ephesians 4, speaking the truth in love. Now, I want to ask you something. Did Jesus speak the truth in love to this man? says he did. Did he speak the truth in love to that Samaritan woman? says he did. Why? Because his desire was for them to be right with God and to be saved in the end. When we talk to people and we point out the problem with their sin, that will separate them from God. My friend, how do I know the heart that's there to say to one person, you're doing that out of love and you're doing it out of spite. I don't know a man's heart. Neither do you. Only God does. But I know the content of that is not necessarily unloving. It is necessary to love. 
that person that we point at that wrong. If not, then Jesus spoke in a way that was unnecessary. But if what he did was necessary, then it's necessary for you and me as well. Sometimes I hear people talk about, well, we just need to bring before them Jesus. Not all these things about matters that don't matter any, instrumental music or idea that's out here of denominationalism or the order of worship or whatever else out there. We don't need to worry about that. We just need to bring Jesus. Do you know that when we look over in Ephesians chapter 4, the point is made immediately after Paul has pointed out that we speak the truth in love. Starting in verse 17, he points out to them, you don't live this kind of way. Why? Because, verse 20, you did not so learn what? You did not so learn Christ. For him to condemn adultery, fornication, lying, all of those things was telling them about Jesus. And when I come along and say that is an important we need to speak Jesus instead, I've missed what the scripture is. And I need to go back and get it straight from what Jesus had pointed out. There's another thing about this. It's something that we've made clear through it, but I just want to come out and explicitly point out the fact that God's will is the basis to determine what is to be done. That's why Jesus said to him, what says the law? When he was asked what I need to do to inherit our, what does the word of God say? What's the point that's made by divine inspiration? In John chapter 12, go with me there if you will for a moment. In John chapter 12 and in verse 48. John 12 and in verse 48. Jesus says this, He that rejects me and receives not my sayings hath one that judges him. What's that one that judges him? Look at the next word. The word that I spoke, the same shall judge him in the last day. Why is that true? Why is it the word that Jesus spoke as gospel, the New Testament? Why is it that covenant will judge us? Look back in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Tyson read this for us a few minutes ago. But in Deuteronomy chapter 18, that point is made very clearly. There, Moses is talking about this prophet after the giving of the law that someone else would come along and he would speak the will of God. It was a prophecy of Jesus. There it says, I will raise them up, a prophet from among their brethren, like unto you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whoever will not hearken unto my words which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Well, that's plain, isn't it? God points out the fact, I'll raise up a prophet from among them. He'll come of man. Jesus was brought in. He became man for that very purpose, that he might speak the will of God. What did he tell his apostles on the night of his betrayal? He says in chapter 14, there are many things that I have to say to you. I don't have time to do them right now, but when he, the spirit of truth has come, he'll guide you to all things. In chapter 16, he points out that he's going to speak to you all things that are necessary. And now Jesus says, my words that God has given me, they will judge in the last day. That's exactly what he means. His word is what makes the difference between what is right and wrong. His word is that which is the basis of a judgment of what is right or wrong for us today. And so what do we need to listen to? Not what I feel or you feel. Not someone else feels or thinks is necessary. 
I need to go and get myself into the book of God. That's the only thing that I can read. That's the only thing that I can look at that gives me pure divine truth and is not wrong about anything. When we pour ourselves into that, what does God promise us? God promises that that word works within us. You know, the more you look at the word of God, read the word of God, study the word of God, meditate upon those things, the more it changes you. You can't possibly be one who studies and looks at and cares about and prays about God's word without it changing you more and more and more to be like Jesus. That's why he gave it. and That's why you and I need to understand those things. When we come to be like Jesus more, then we understand what is wrong with our life, what is right with our life, and what is needed in our life. Well, how about it? Shouldn't we question ourselves and ask, am I lacking one thing? Maybe it is that what I'm lacking is that I haven't ridded my life of sin. You know what I notice when somebody says they care about having more of a feeling that they're saved, more of an assurance about that, and not just that they're tripped up by every little sin that comes along the way. What I've noticed is something. They're not worried about one sin. They're worried about more than one. And the fact is, what's really happening is they're growing to be more like the world because they're listening to the world what the theologians of the world and those who are the cares of the world, they're listening to them rather than putting their mind in the book of God. And what happens when people do that? They become more like the world. More like those who believe that sin really isn't a problem in your life. Jesus took care of all of that, and I can live any way I want now because I believe in Jesus. That's not what Jesus said. Might it be that I need to ask myself, is there one thing that I'm lacking? And maybe that is serving others the way that I should. You know, that's necessary. Jesus said the greatest of all is him that's what? The servant of all. You can't get to heaven without serving. If I think somehow I'm the one that's most important and I'm the one to be served and not to do the service, something big time is wrong with me. And what's wrong with me is I haven't come to be like Jesus is. I think you can recognize that. Because serving is a part of being the child of God that I should be, and it's a part of entering into heaven. You remember in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus has those there of all the world before him. And what does he say? He said, you saw me naked and you didn't do anything. You saw me thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. You saw me in prison, you didn't come to visit me. I say, when did we see you like that? In as much as you did it not to one of these little ones who did it not to me. Service is important. Sometimes we give ourselves the idea that I'm too important to do this. I've got other things that I need to do. You aren't too important to be a servant. You know why? Because Jesus was. Jesus left heaven's throne to come down and be a servant among us. And if he needed to be a servant to show me what I need to do, then I sure need to be a servant, whoever I think I am in this world. Or maybe it is that I'm thinking, well, you know, I obeyed the Lord. But you know that growth matter, it just takes too much time. And surely God's not going to condemn me just because I've stayed about the same for the last 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 or 40 years in my knowledge of God's will or in my service to him, surely that wouldn't cause me to be condemned, really? 
When I look at the Word of God, what does He expect? He expects service. He accepts growth in knowledge. He accepts growth in action of obedience all of the time. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, points out very clearly as Paul talks to them, he said, I told you about how you're full of spiritual knowledge. But then what did they do? They put that into use. They started to serve him. And they grew in knowledge after that. Question, how could they be full of knowledge yet growing in knowledge? Because that's what Paul prayed for. If you study the word of God, you don't have to know about that. You already know. That when you study it, you come to understand some things. You see fully what you need to do right now. But that doesn't mean by next year you hadn't learned a whole lot more. And then you need to do that. And when you do that and you're studying, you're learning a whole lot more. And what happens? It's an ever-growing process. Maybe I need to ask myself whether I'm doing that. Or am I worshiping and serving the Lord daily like I should? You know, our prayer shouldn't just be here. Our song shouldn't just be here. Our worship to God, in those ways that he has declared five acts of worship that he has given to give reverence and praise to him, he doesn't desire to just hear that every now and then. That's daily. Do you remember what Daniel was like? When they passed the ordinance that says you cannot have any more prayers to anyone except the king, what Daniel do? Daniel opened up his doors toward Jerusalem as his habit was every day, three times a day. And he kept on doing the same thing. You know what? We need to be those who recognize if all we're going to gain spiritually is what we gain here when we come together, we're going to be awfully weak Christians. That needs to be something that's every day. Would Jesus look into my life and say, Harry, all you're doing a few times a week, that's it, when you gather together with other people. And that ain't going to cut it. Would he say that to you? I need to think about that because that may be one thing I'm lacking. Or it may be that one thing you're lacking is you've not fully obeyed the gospel of Christ this morning. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that's a great thing. That's what you need to do. But unlike what the rest of the religious world tells you around you, that doesn't make you a child of God on the basis of faith only. In James 2, the point is made very clearly that even the demons believe in Jesus. And they tremble. But what do you need to do? You need to learn that faith apart from works or obedience, is dead. That's what James points out at the end of that chapter. When people on the day of Pentecost asked, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They were ones who had sinned. They had done what's right. And in essence, they're asking, Is there anything we still need to do? Just like Jesus, what did Peter say to them? He said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That salvation that had been promised of God through the Holy Spirit that Peter had begun to talk about when he said, Joel said this in time past, it's happening right now. That same salvation, that same blood of Christ and that same forgiveness of every single sin to make you right in the sight of God is still available for you today. What do you need to do? What did the law say about that? What does the word of God say? What did Jesus declare? Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. You see, the fact is, it would be a terrible thing to learn too late what I ought to do. We have a song that sometimes we sing that how terrible would it be to have that not said when somebody in judgment came and said, you never mentioned him to me. Jesus didn't hate people like that. Jesus loved them. 
And he loved them enough to tell them what they needed to do to be right in the sight of God. If you're here this morning, and what you've heard pricks your heart, and you hurt because you recognize, I hadn't done what's right. I want you to know something. That hadn't been done to hurt you. That's been done to move you. That's what happened in New Testament times. In Acts chapter 2, they were pricked in their hearts, it says. Are you pricked in the heart? Are you ready to let it move you because of your love for the Lord who loves you? That you're ready to serve him this very day. If you've never been baptized into Christ, we're ready to help you. We're ready to bring you into that watery grave to raise you up because of the blood of Jesus Christ having your sins cleansed to live in the newness of life. If you've done that, but you've gone away from that, Jesus' blood is still available. Will you not repent and pray Him? Maybe it's private in its nature or public in its nature, and we can help you either way. We're not unloving when we invite you. Jesus and His love is with us as well, asking you, won't you do what's necessary to inherit eternal life? Live as God would have you to live. And won't you come right now while we stand and while we sing? Zion.